This is Tracy Drummond here today in Delville, Alabama with Sandy Shin, who is going to um, be interviewed for the Machinist Oral History Project that we have at the Southern Labor Archives, Georgia State University. Today is the 3rd of October, 2017, and we are at the lo Local Lodge 2003 or 2003, uh, as they uh, say locally. and. Um, Sandy, I just want to uh, get your confirmation uh, on camera, on audio, that you understand that we are going to be making these uh, interviews available to researchers and putting them online, making them available also in person in our, if people come to visit the archives, and that you understand that it, it is going to be shared with people. Yes, I understand and that. You that. And you consent to be interviewed. I consent, okay. yes, I do. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we'll get started then, and my first question for everybody is, where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in Dothan, Alabama, uh, let's see, August the 25th, 1958. Okay. And what did your parents do when you were little? My mother is uh, an LPN nurse, and my father was in the Navy. Okay. So a career of Navy. Right. Mm -hmm. Did y'all move around a lot? Uh, actually, um, they got a divorce when I was three. Mm. So um, I lived in Pensacola for a little short time, but I don't remember that. With and your dad? With, well, with both of them. Okay. Before they got divorced. And then uh, my mother, um, we moved back here to Dayton, and that's when she went to nursing school. Okay. And uh, she worked as a, a nurse while I was growing up. Were you an only child? Do you have brothers and sisters? Uh, I'm my mother's only child. Uh, I, uh, my father actually had two boys. One of them got killed uh, at 17 in a vehicle accident. But my other brother is a fire chief in the Union uh, in Fort Myers, Florida. Okay. So you've stayed close yes. to your mm -hmm. dad and your brother. Right. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, so, tell me about growing up in Dothan. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I grew up in the country, okay. in a little community outside of Dothan. Um, uh, my grandparents had a farm. I worked on the farm during the summer, and uh, so I had my cousin that was two years older than me, and all that lived around them was boys. So I grew up as a tomboy um, when we weren't having to pick peas and butter beans and <laughs> all that good stuff. We'd play and uh, we'd build forts and we'd go play in the creeks and, you know, but uh, play football. So I thought I was a, you know, I always wanted to be a boy. They had fun. <laughs> well, your grandparents, um, like the crops that they grew, were they more for for their own use, or was did they make a living off of their farm? They made a living off of it. Okay, mm -hmm. off yeah. of vegetables. Off of vegetables and mm -hmm. um, hogs and cows also. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, what about school? Did you enjoy? Yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed school. Um, now, my mother did get remarried, and he was a career Marine, and we did move around some, so I, I was um, here uh, most of the time, mm -hmm. but um, I did go to some elementary schools in North Carolina, uh, but he retired when I was in the seventh grade, and we moved back um, here today then, and so I graduated from Rehoboth High School. Okay. It was uh, a country school, kind of where everybody knew everybody, and so it was, uh, it was fun. So what did your stepfather do after he retired? Uh, he was a deputy sheriff okay. for Houston County. Okay. So you were growing up in a household with a sheriff and a nurse. Right. So That was interesting. I couldn't <laughs> go anywhere <laughs> without them knowing where I was. <laughs> I'd get home and my dad would go, what were you doing over on so-and-so road? And I'm like, what? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that is the peril of a, just a small town in general, that 
uh, even yeah. if your parents aren't, even if your dad's not right. not a, a sheriff, then mm -hmm. yeah, not apparel, but yeah. You know. <laughs> um, so as you were entering high school, what were you thinking about? Do I mean what was expected of you? Did your did your parents talk to you about what your options were once you graduated, or were there um, any expectations? No, not really. They um, they were real supportive, and you know, of kind of whatever I wanted to do. Um, I made um, mostly straight A's. I wasn't the smartest kid in the class, but I was in the top ten. Um, That's great. But uh, uh, things kind of went uh, in the opposite direction, and I ended up getting married at 17, so I, I didn't go to college. Okay. And I had a child. Okay. But, um, well, I wouldn't say that that's the opposite. That's not a bad thing. Well, it, well you know, I mean, it, you know, I just I had a lot of potential mm -hmm. to have went, you know, mm -hmm. to college and, you know, got a, um, a career in something else. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other side of that, um, I wouldn't be where I am today because um, I, I got in the aviation field and got in the union okay. and um, I've been real happy and satisfied with what I've done. So um, you had Shana? Shana. Shana mm -hmm. in 1975 mm -hmm. and tell me about that. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, 17, so it was uh, it was a, a growing learning experience. <laughs> were you a junior in high school? No, uh, -uh. You I were was already? a senior. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was. Uh, so she was born after you graduated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, she uh, she was the joy of my life. She kept me going. Um, we we're real, real close, and still are to this day. So um, yeah, it's. Uh, it was nice. And you married her father? Yeah, we were married for a few years and got a divorce. And then uh, I got remarried. I guess uh, we've been married for 28 years now. So. so in between having a baby and getting married and setting up a household mm -hmm. and all of the things that come with that, when did you, what were some of your early jobs that you were doing around that time? Uh, yeah. Like, um, one of my first jobs was working at McDonald's. Yeah. And uh, then I, I worked at the uh, Pepsi Cola Bottling Company. Um, started out working on the, the line that does the two liter drinks. Uh, they send them through a machine and fill them up. Mm -hmm. And then they come down the line and, and uh, you had to put the tops on them, the caps. And it, with, would rotate around and like six of them would fit in this thing that's rotating around and if they got off a little bit it would squeeze <laughs> and so you would just get drowned with a soft drink all over you and you'd have to get it you know run down and hit this button to stop it and get it all back in order again yeah. um yeah that was uh, how long did that last uh, I did that for probably about a year, mm -hmm. but um, then they had an opening in the quality department. Okay. Um, so then I, uh, they moved me there, and we did all the testing on the, the soft drinks and um, you know, made sure that they were mixed right and tasted right and the cans were done and all that. So it was, it was interesting. And that was in the 80s? Mm-hmm. Well, that, that was in the 70s because I started my first um, job in aviation in 81. So okay, yeah. okay. So that was before Pepsi Light. Do you remember Pepsi Light that had lemon in it? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, that I didn't, we didn't have that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you were there in, in quality. Did you, did they have a union? No. Mm -mm. Did you ever hear people talking about unions Never. when you were growing up? Like it was just. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even know what a union was at that time. Okay. okay. And where was the Pepsi Cola bottling company? It was in Dothan. Okay. 
So that's not too far from Daleville? Mm-mm, no. Okay. Uh, now they don't run uh, a line anymore. It's more of a warehouse. Okay. They, uh, I think they're in Atlanta mostly is where the stuff is shipped in here and then distributed. Okay. Okay. And was that the last job you had before you got into aviation? Yes. So tell me about that, like what drew you to aviation? Um, actually, um, my stepfather was a, uh, my mother had gotten divorced and remarried and my stepfather uh, was a lead electrician out at um, Hayes International uh, beside Dothan Airport. And they started up a beginner's program. And uh, so he talked to me about it and uh, I filled out application. Was that kind of like an apprenticeship Yes, program? It's, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. basically it was an apprenticeship, but um, they called it a beginner program then, where I guess the government paid them so much money to uh, train individuals because they needed more workers and they couldn't couldn't get them. So um, I interviewed and uh, got hired. Um, we had a six month training period and um, I made it through all of that. Uh, we could join the union after our 90 days. Mm -hmm. And so I joined the union. It was uh, you know, not mandatory, but my stepdad was a big believer in the union and he was like, you know, you got to join the union. I'm like, sure, you know, I'll join the union. <laughs> and that was Local Lodge 1632? Yeah, okay. 1632. Um, and um, then uh, when I got my six months in, I was actually an aircraft mechanic. And I did that for six years. Um, but um, kept getting laid off. And I was a single parent raising a daughter. Um, so I put in to transfer into sheet metal because at the time sheet metal had more work and they didn't get laid off. And they let me transfer. And uh, so ever since then, that's what I've done is been a sheet metal mechanic. So. Uh, so tell me about the work of an aircraft mechanic. What were some of the duties of that? Position. Yeah, uh, as an aircraft mechanic um, at Hayes, we worked on 727s, 737s. We did have some military projects, um, but uh, I worked mostly like on 727s and 737s, and you would have inspections. So you would, uh, like in the baggage compartments, you'd have to pull the liners out of the baggage compartment and check all the um, structures, the aluminum beams, and because uh, in the baggage compartment, they're bad about corroding because you got the uh, bathrooms mm. over them and they'll leak down. And um, so you pull all that and you clean and you know, you put it all back together. Uh, you, you change the tires, you check the engine, the oil, and you know, it's just, you know, maintenance, mm -hmm. but at a different level on what you would do with your car. And so Hayes was a was a company or was it an airport? It was a company that... Um, and do they contract different airlines right. to, to mm -hmm. do the maintenance? Right, they did. Okay, so and what are some of the airlines you work with? Um, well, we... Uh, Hayes was bought out uh, through different places, but it ended up being PIMCO. Okay. Um, we did uh, FedEx, UPS, um, Northwest. We did uh, over some overseas ones, but we put in cargo doors, um, which was very very interesting. You just take a, a airplane and you cut a hole in the side of it. And install a big door, you know, and that was that was a lot. So they were turning passenger planes into cargo right. planes. Mm -hmm. Did y'all have to take out all the seats and do oh, that yeah. kind of? Mm -hmm. Did all of that. But what's what's really interesting, and this is goes into when I was doing sheet metal, is we did transfer some into what they called cargo and passenger, and your seats were um, 
bolted down on pallets, mm -hmm. and you could slide the pallets in and out for when um, you needed to haul cargo. If you wanted to haul passengers, you just loaded those pallets back in and you had your seats. Okay, kind of like passenger vans that had right, uh, yeah. cargo. Right, yeah, you know, they okay. could use it for more than one thing. Mm -hmm. But um, Interesting, I didn't realize that that was, do they do that now or was that just something? Yeah, they, they, they do it now, okay. uh, but it's not PIMCO because they, you know, they, they went bankrupt. Okay. Uh, commercial Jet finally bought them, bought the facility, mm -hmm. and um, they're still doing some of the same work. Uh, but other than putting cargo doors in, we did uh, different checks on airplanes. It depends on the number of hours that they're flying, so you have you know different uh, checks that you have to do on them. And um, we had uh, Northwest uh, that we did a, a lot of maintenance work on them, and then they would uh, come in and remodel, and they'd want new carpet new seats, mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, we did a lot of different type of work out there. Okay. And at the time, did you know that the um, Northwest was organized with the Machinist too? Uh, yes, we did. Um, at, at that time, they, they were uh, um, under the different union, they oh. weren't. Yeah, they hadn't gone to the IAM except part of them. I think some of them were, and okay. the other part was under a different one. Okay, okay. Um, I didn't realize. Yeah, but um, it was kind of that they didn't have enough people and stuff to to handle all their maintenance, mm -hmm. and so we, you know, we did it out here. Okay. So once you started this job. Did you like the work? Did you enjoy the work? I really enjoyed the work, but I, and I enjoyed the people. We worked a lot of hours. Um, it wasn't anything for us to work seven days a week, 10 and 12 hours a day, and you just became like a big family, because you actually spent more time with them than you did your own families a lot of times. But um, yeah, it was something new every day. You know, it was a challenge. How were you managing being a single mom at that time and having a job that kept you out of the house seven days yeah, a week? Yeah, uh, I had a lot of help from my mom, and I had some really good friends. Um, uh, we lived in an apartment complex, and I had a, like two different really good friends that had children the same age, and, um, and they helped me a lot. You know, you heard that phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. That was kind of my child. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, were you making good money for a woman in the late 70s, early 80s? To yeah, I mean, because, you know, like, um, I made minimum wage at McDonald's, and I didn't make much more than that when I worked at Pepsi. But um, when I hired in in 1981, I started out at four dollars an hour. And what was minimum wage at the time? It was two. Mm. I want to say like maybe two thirty-five. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I had never had insurance, and uh, you know, so I went from basically nothing to having a four dollar an hour job and uh, insurance and sick time and holiday pay and vacation. But I was, I was just you know. On top of the world. Were you getting time and a half for all the extra yes. hours? Mm -hmm. So we your did. contract was really inclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we got uh, had time and a half for Saturdays and double time on Sundays. Mm -hmm. um, the time and a half on Saturday, you had to have your forty hours in prior to that. Though you couldn't like miss a couple of days and then make your mm -hmm. time and a half on Saturday. But it didn't matter. Sundays was always double time. Okay. And did y'all already have a pension plan at that point too? We they had a pension plan, but uh, at, out there it never was through the IM. Okay. Um, and we never was able to get that changed. Okay. Um, so you started in as an aircraft mechanic, and you went to sheet metal. Mm -hmm. How was that work different from aircraft? Uh, well, uh, the mechanics, it's a lot of um, taking a part out and reinstalling it. Mm -hmm. Sheet metal, you build the parts out of metal. Uh, so you are actually fabricating them. 
drilling them up, you know, and then putting them in. So it's uh, it's like an art, kind of, is the way it's always been described. Some people can do it and some can't. Some people can do it better than others. I mean, there's some really talented people out there. So were y'all, did y'all get extra on-the-job training for? Uh, no, you learned it all on the job. Okay. And was there sort of a, like a feeling of camaraderie and mentorship and, um, you know, in the workplace where? Yes, there was. It was, you know, because I could never have made it. Um, I'd never even been on the inside of an airplane. Mm -hmm. until I went out there uh, but once you showed them that you were willing to get in and try anything you know didn't care about getting dirty and and all that um, they'd help you mm -hmm. they didn't mind at all and with me um, at that time I was real small um, so you know with the heavy lifting and stuff I you know but I wouldn't ask for help. I'd try to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And so then they would come over and try to help, you know, they'd help me do stuff. But then there was um, areas that they couldn't get in because they were too big and they couldn't get their hands in small places to put nuts on and all. And, and I would help them. So it was, you know, we both all kind of worked together. So did you ever feel like there was any pushback about you being a woman on the shop floor? Oh, yeah. I Can mean, you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and it wasn't all of them, but you did have certain ones that um, resented women being in the workplace because they, they felt like you should be at home. Um, a lot of them thought that women could only do like the cleaning and, and those type jobs. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, things have changed a lot over the years, but when I first started in 81, there was a lot of that. Um, but I was lucky enough that I got into a good crew, had a good supervisor um, that was like, you know, you want to learn this? And I was like, yes. And, uh, and they would let me get in there and do it, so. Were there ever any so of the people who maybe had an issue with women in the mm -hmm. workplace, were did the company ever come out and say, to, to support, I mean, was there ever like an action taken that said, no, everybody needs to be treated with respect in the workplace? Or Back in 81, um, it was different than what it is now. Um, you kind of handled the stuff on your own. Um, and, and they didn't, I, I never really went and caused waves, you know. Um, I just kind of did what, you know, they told me to do because mm -hmm. I really needed the job. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, like I said, I'd get with some other people and they would show me, so that kind of made up for it. Um, but like, um, I had, you know, some of them think that you know, they could take advantage of you or they try to, you know, do things that was inappropriate. Um, like physical? Physical, okay. you know, like um, I was um, inside the cockpit on my hands and knees working and um, one of the guys would come up there and kind of pinch me on the butt. And by the time I could turn around, he was gone. And uh, he did that like three times, and so I was ready for him the fourth time. I had my hammer in my hand, and he came up and pinched me, and I turned around real quick, and I drew back that hammer, and I told him in very plain language if he did that again, I was going to knock him upside the head with that hammer, and he laughed. I had never had a bit of trouble out of that man after that. It was just like you had to earn their respect mm -hmm. and show them that, you know, you weren't there for that reason. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I never had any trouble then. Okay. So you started working and you joined the union and you said that it was an open shop that not everybody had to join. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got two questions related okay. to that. So one of them is, in the workplace, was there maybe tension between the folks who did and didn't? Because certainly the people who 
don't join still get all the workplace benefits right. of mm -hmm. the contract. Mm -hmm. um, was there ever tension between the two groups? And about what percentage was it? Um, I don't know when I first started the percentage, um, but after I got involved, there was maybe 15 that um, weren't in the union up to our 300 and something that was. So it was very low percentage. Mm -hmm. um, and I know to start with, when I first hired in, um, if you weren't in the union, the ones that were would not let you borrow any tools. You know, they kind of shunned you, they wouldn't talk to you, and you know, it was handled that way. And a lot of them would join because, you know, they didn't want to feel like an outcast. And, mm -hmm. you know, you couldn't afford all the tools that you needed. And, you know, everybody would borrow from each other. When you say afford, Mm -hmm. Were you expected to purchase your own tools? Oh, yeah, we had, we had to buy our own tools. When I hired in, I had a list that I had to to go buy. That's surprising, and that sounds incredibly expensive when you're starting a job. It is. I uh, I borrowed the money from my parents to buy my tools. Did that change over time? Um, it depends. Most of your government facilities, they furnish your tools now, mm -hmm. but a lot of um, your other shops, you furnish your own tools. And is that sort of standard for? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. That's really surprising. I was not, I was not aware that that was um, a requirement. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that kept people from taking jobs there because they couldn't afford to go out and... No, I don't. Because I do know that we had some people that couldn't afford it, you know, mm -hmm. and they would come in um, and everybody would loan them the stuff until they got to where they could start buying their own tools. Okay. You know, okay. I mean, it, it, it was more uh, of a sharing, caring type thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, tell me again about how many employees were there? Um, I think when I hired in there was probably around 500 and it's fluctuated, you know, up to like 800 when we were going. Um, at one time we were building all of the parts that it took to put in the cargo doors. Um, so there was like a just a hundred people in a shop that just did nothing but manufacture parts. Okay. Um, and what were some of the other department? Well, let me ask this question, mm -hmm. then I then I've mm -hmm. got another question about the unit. What did, what were some of the other um, department other than aircraft and sheet metal? What were some of the other departments, and what were other folks responsible? We had, yeah, for? we had painters. Okay. Um, we had uh, strip rack workers that um, put stripper on the uh, airplanes to take all the paint off of them and then the painters would repaint them. A lot of your airlines would change their color scheme and you know, or they just get really ragged and they want a new paint job. We had an upholstery shop that would take the carpets and the seat covers off you know, and, and clean them or either make some more and repair them. So they would actually manifest, so there was sewing yeah, facilities. Yeah, they were sewing, mm -hmm. um, We had uh, electricians that did all the wires, hooked up all the switches and um, let's see if we had anything else. We had a welder, an engine shop that um, we take the engines off and, and uh, take it over to the engine shop. We had hydraulic shop. So there's a lot of different people and classifications. And um, but may, oh, yeah, I'll leave out the most important one, I guess, is inspectors. Okay. That um, once you do your work, it's got to be checked by somebody. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, they have a really important job. Because they go behind you and look. Because uh, nobody's perfect and you're going to make a mistake. You know, you're going to leave a, a nut off of something or, you know, and they would go behind you and check your work. And were there um, inspectors with specialties in each department or 
was there inspector training so they could kind of inspect anything? Uh, it was mostly that they all could inspect this, you know, everything except um, like borescope. Uh, that's where they have this machine that they can put down in a hole and check for cracks. Mm. And um, those required special training. Okay, and what's that called again? Uh, boroscope. Okay. And um, there's another one, I can't remember what it's called, where they check for cracks. Um, ND testing. Uh, NDI. NDI. Yeah, NDI. Thank you, Freddie. Um, so what does NDI stand for? <sighs> Non-destructive inspection. Right. It's like um, when you when you uh, take all of the covering and the um, stuff off of the inside of the airplanes, it's just you know like I said, beans and stuff made out of different thicknesses of metal, and they get stressed from all the landings and you know and they'll get cracks and sometimes the cracks real noticeable and you can see it but sometimes you're not so sure and then you call for NDI and they come with a little machine and they it tells you where the crack starts and where it ends and okay. if there is a crack okay okay that's really interesting mm-hmm I think so back to my other, so, mm -hmm. so you've been there, you've joined the union, mm -hmm. and you're coming back and you're talking to your friends, and was there any, ever any feedback for you about, from the community about being in a union? Did you ever get? No. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Okay. And I'm only asking just because the South is it's traditionally mm -hmm. so anti-union. Right. Um, although I, what I always maintain is that there are more unions than people think. And that people just don't talk about it as right. much. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so, when did you get involved? Did you ever work as a shop steward or join I, any committees or anything like that? Uh, believe it or not, my first job that I took was a uh, financial secretary. So you moved right on up. I just moved right on in there. I jumped in there feet first, you know. Um, so you were a member from 81 to 2005, but you didn't run. Did you have to run? Yes, I ran. Um, I was trying to remember the year. That here, it, here it has you as secretary treasurer, but you said financial secretary. It's the same for, thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, starting in 1990. Yeah, 1990. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, what made you, because, you know, so many folks are in a, in a union and they appreciate being in the union and they come to meetings and they support, but not that many people run or want to be involved right. with, as an officer. Mm -hmm. So what made you want to? Um, I had started going to the union meetings because um, I wanted to find out you know, more about it since uh, I was paying dues and uh, the president of our local was Tommy Knight, and um, the financial secretary at that time, um, I, won't, I won't call his name, but um, anyway, Tommy wasn't, um, he was wanting somebody different, mm. and he came to me, and he talked to me about it, um, and explained what all it was, and um, told me what was going on. So I was like, yeah. I thought he gave me time to think about it, mm -hmm. you know. So anyway, I, I decided that it, something that it needed to be changed. We needed a change mm -hmm. in that position. Um, so I ran and I won. And um, uh, it was a mess. The financial records were Records a mess. was in a mess and um, tax forms hadn't been done on time. Uh, it was just a lot of different things. Um, and um, so I was glad that I did take over. Um, what, do you, what do you think Tommy saw in you that, that encouraged him to? You know, I really don't know, except for the fact that um, 
I mean, I had always been the one that um, when somebody would get hurt or be out sick or there was a death in the family, I would be the one to go around take up money and do for, you know, um, and I guess I was trustworthy and you got to have somebody like that handling the money for the lo locals. So I think that was probably one of the things. Okay. Um, did y'all ever come under, it, there's a particular word maybe when your local, typically it has to do with finances, it's not being handled correctly, and... Right, I know what you're talking about. Um, Freddie, do you know when your local is maybe financially having issues? That's what Blevins was out there doing in... Oh. It's a very specific word? Yes. It just, but no, we did Tr not. No, no, not trusteeship. No. Not, not receivership. No. no. Dang, we all know that word, and none of us can think of mm -hmm. it. But what? And we'll think of it in a minute. But was that was your local under that? No, uh, -uh. Okay. ours never did. Um, Galen Allen had had been the uh, financial secretary prior to the one that I replaced. Mm -hmm. And he was a business rep for District 75. Um, and he was from our local, 1632. And he had told me that he would help me. Okay. And, you know, so whenever I started finding everything, you know, I called Galen and I said, you know, this is in a mess. And I was handed all the financial records in grocery bags. <laughs> yes. That's terrible. And um, whenever Galen got over to our office and he walked in and he saw that, because you could tell, I mean, you could look in the files, and Galen was, oh, I mean, everything, every I was dotted, every T was crossed. And uh, he just was like, oh my, I am so sorry. You know? <laughs> so he, he helped me a lot. And um, my Grand Lodge auditor at the time was Jay Borman. That I took over the, yeah, did you, uh, the guide dog. Jay, yeah, right. yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, I'll never forget, it was on a Sunday afternoon, and I was sitting at home watching TV, and the phone rang, and I answered it, and, and he said, this is Jay Borman, I'm your Grand Lodge auditor. Well, all I heard was auditor, you know, <laughs> and I'm just, you know, I was new at this, and it scared the mess out of me. I'm thinking, oh my God. And, and he can be a real intense guy. You know, and so I was like, uh, yeah, and so he was like, you know, I get in touch with all the new officers, you know, and um, and I'm going, uh, and who did you say you were again? <laughs> I, mean, I couldn't even get, and he told me again. I was like, okay. And uh, so then he started asking me questions. And I was, I guess he could tell I was hesitant. And uh, he said, uh, look, I'm here to help you. I'm not here to hurt you. You know, I'm here to straighten out anything and stuff. And so he started asking me stuff, and I said, do you want me to tell you the truth? <laughs> He's like, yeah. So then I opened up, and I went to tell him. Well, then he came in. And um, and how long had that person before you been in charge of the finances? Probably four years. Okay. Yeah. And But he came, he came down? He came down. Okay. And uh, helped me, and that's when you did everything on paper. There was, you know, no computers or anything like that. So, uh, but we got it all straightened out, got everything running smoothly. So, uh, that's quite an accomplishment. So yeah, well, I, you know, I learned the hard way. <laughs> and you did that for fifteen years. Yes. So you must have really enjoyed it. I did. I, this, it, I guess that's, you know, I've never wanted to hold any other office. Um, I, uh, 
I know the finances. I know what you know, basically what we can and can't do. Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned a lot. Still learning, though. Mm-hmm. I, I never hesitate. If I'm not sure, I pick up the phone and I call my auditor. If something's going on. I call my auditor. <laughs> um. So, during the time that you were with Local Lodge 1632, were there any strikes or boycotts or other actions like that that... Oh, oh yeah. Okay. We went out on strike. Um, Do you remember? The I year? can't remember what year it was. Can you remember approximately? Was it early 80s, mid 80s? Who was president? Do you remember that? Uh, Tommy Knight was. It had no, to be. No, who was president of the United oh, States? Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> You're asking me something I don't even. <laughs> I'm going to remember my own name. Uh, um, I know it had to be after 1990 because I was the ST. Okay, okay, um, so it's after you'd already. Yeah, it was after I had already taken the okay. position. Mm-hmm. Um, we went out on strike, and um, what was. Um, I don't remember. Some of the main issues, uh, but naturally, you know, it was like uh, they wanted to take away and not, you know, not give us. Um, but we went out on strike, and um, I learned all about the strike fund and how that operates. So you had kind of been, maybe not responsible for it, but maybe did that fall under your purview, and you just never had to use it. Right, I had never been on a strike until I was in office, um, and I was trying to remember, we weren't out, but maybe like um, four weeks, Okay. it, was, it wasn't a long strike, we were out about four weeks. It, it was probably around 94, Okay. because that's when Galen moved to the, uh, as an administrative assistant to uh, Barb Mar- Martinez, and I was appointed... At the Southern Territory Office? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was appointed a uh, temporary business rep, and the first day on the job I was told that PIMCO was on strike, okay. and that was one of my contracts. Okay. okay. So it was around that. Mm-hmm. So, um... Did it take a lot, do you remember what the mood was like with membership? Did it take a lot to get them to go out? Because a strike is a big deal, and a strike fund is rarely adequate to really cover people's... Um, no. Um, it's, you know, just sometimes right, yeah. folks are hesitant. Like, what was the mood? What was um, the... I, I think um, it was... Uh, Mostly everybody, you know, was kind of prepared and that they felt that we needed to strike. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't, uh, you didn't have, um, well, we ended up having two people that crossed the picket line. Um, and we brought charges up on those two individuals mm-hmm. later. Okay. Um, Other than that, there really wasn't any issues, you know, everybody okay. just, and it helped that it wasn't, you know, that long of a strike mm-hmm. either. But you said four weeks. Yeah. So that's when you first started using the strike fund. Mm-hmm. Was it, was it? Um, I believe it was like $80. A week? A week. And, but was it, did y'all have enough, did y'all have enough for, Five hundred to eight hundred. Do you kind of remember membership around that time? Was it larger? It was smaller mm-hmm. because usually what would happen is the company would, um, on purpose, not bring work in around that time, and they would be layoffs. Okay. So once negotiations started, yeah, there it would it would, it would have a reduction. Like, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And they used that too as a tactic, I think, to scare everybody you know into uh, not striking well they're you know they're not going to bring the work in you know we don't need to do this but um, on this one it didn't work 
What do you think finally sort of forced the hand of the company to, to negotiate? What um, were they trying to take away benefits? Or yeah, they, benefit. They, you know, they wanted to uh, make us. We were fortunate enough that we never paid any deductibles. Uh, I mean, any any part of our insurance. They paid the whole uh, premium, mm -hmm. and you know they wanted us to start paying uh, on our premiums, and uh, they didn't want to give us uh, a cost of living raise or any other type of raise. So. Um, and I don't remember much of the other issues on that one. So what what do you think brought them to the table? Or what did finally bring them to the um, table? We had um, a man um, that was a rep. And I can't remember the name of the company. Um, but he did not want the supervisors uh, and, you know, management working on his airplanes. And um, sometimes they would get in a financial bind mm -hmm. and he would front them the money to make payroll. So he had a lot of pull and he kind of told them, you get them back to work. and. Uh, he was a big influence, I, okay. I believe, in getting the company to sit down with us. So he was a rep for one of the companies that contracted the right. company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's an interesting point of view when you've got a corporate person kind of oh, yeah. telling the other company mm -hmm. to, to... I mean, he was... Uh, Negotiating. Yeah, he... Um, it, it was real, real hot in the summertime, and um, he would actually bring in big ice chests full of Gatorade and water for the people that were working. Really? Yes. I mean, yeah. I, I think, I mean, really he took kind of better care of us <laughs> than uh, our own company did. Right. Mm -hmm. That is a very interesting yeah. story. You don't hear that too often. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, and that was the only strike, though, you had while you were with... 1632? That was the only strike. Now, we were locked out. Oh, well, and how was the lockout different from a strike? Right. Um, with a uh, strike, the membership voted and decided to go out on strike. When you're locked out, the company decided for us and locked the gates and wouldn't let us come in to work. We were in uh, negotiations. And was that after the was that after the strike? Uh, yeah, this was in 2005. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was in 2005. Um, we decided to um, go back in and work without a contract and leave it up to our negotiating committee to decide when they worked out something to bring to us. Um, the company didn't know what to think when they found out that, you know, we were just going to come in and work. Um, we all showed up the next morning and they had locked the gate. We couldn't get in. And they had brought in contract workers and they had them staying at one hotel in Dathan had hired off-duty officers to manage the parking lot and rented a limousine service. But, um, they also had like big buses to bus them back and forth to work to take our jobs. Um, so was the concern there that y'all were going to hurt people? Who were I think that's in? what they thought because um, this was a new company that had came in. And, oh, they took over PIMCO. Right, and uh, they left it. Um, they kept PIMCO and just added like PIMCO World Air Services. Okay. Um, and this was really their first time negotiating with the union. Mm. Um, they had, you know, I mean, you know, like I said, we were close out there, even management and stuff. But they didn't want them talking to us, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, but we had 
um, one of their supervisors that had been a union member and had moved up, he would fry fish and stuff and bring it down to the union hall and <laughs> we'd all sit around and, you know, and eat fish and stuff. Um, but they, uh, by us being locked out, the communities in the area, they could, um, they felt sorry for us. They, you know, it was different because we wanted to work mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let us. Where when you go out on strike, the community takes this look like, well, you make this kind of money and you got all these benefits and you're not working. And, you know, they, some of them don't like that about us. So, but when they locked us out, I mean, everybody got behind us. Uh, even the people that would deliver stuff stopped delivering, like UPS and FedEx even. They would have to go and pick their own stuff up. So it was like a sympathy demonstration. It was, exactly. Um, the, um, we always ordered from different um, places, and they would you know, bring the food out. And um, when they found out we were on, on uh, lockout, they wouldn't deliver. Mm. I mean, you know, the, I mean, everybody, it was, it was wonderful. Everybody got behind us. We had people um, that would bring donuts, that would bring biscuits. We had, um, it was a little uh, store that had a little restaurant in it that we ordered from during the week out there. And once a week, they would uh, bring hot dogs and uh, fed us hot dogs. Uh, McLean's in Delville, uh, one of our good restaurants that um, local 2003 orders food from. Uh, 2003, at the time, when they would order, everybody would put a dollar extra in. So once a week, they fed us. Okay. Um, because you couldn't go out on, you were locked out and not on strike, you didn't qualify for the strike fund. Well, yeah, no, we got the strike fund. Oh, you, okay, fund. so you were able to get the we strike fund. We were able to get the strike fund, but, you know, they knew how hard it it was, and um, so they fed us the ones that were, were walking the picket lines and manning the phones and, you know, doing all that stuff, and we had different locals from the area that would come and grill hamburgers. Um, we set up a food drive. Um, and we had it um, in one of the rooms, all the canned goods and things. So when some of our families would uh, need food, we had a committee that was in charge of that, and they would give them groceries, and we had school supplies, we had baby stuff. Um, we had a, like an emergency fund. We had a committee that was over that. Um, we had one member that's um, daughter fell and broke her tooth and you know once you locked out or you got on strike your insurance is is stopped you don't have any insurance mm -hmm. um so we paid her dentist bill so she could go ahead and get that tooth fixed um, and we had a guy that was uh doing the hiring in mobile um, for mobile aerospace that basically does the same kind of work and they needed workers and they didn't care if it was going to be a week a month or two months or whatever they needed them and they sent a recruiter in that stayed at the union hall and he hired our people mm -hmm. and um, our people would rent rooms and stay together we'd send food with them to help them and uh, uh, you know it was just a big family, we all work together. How long did that go on? How long were y'all locked out? Three months. Three months, okay. And so y'all were negotiating, your contract expired, and you decided to go back to work without a contract, mm -hmm. but I, did that include though an understanding that you would be working under the expired contract's terms? until the new one was negotiated or no they told us that you know if they told us like i was sheet metal if they told us to go do a mechanic job we'd go do that mechanic okay job. okay um you okay. know 
Okay. And then, so you're negotiating, the folks on your negotiating committee, did that include somebody from the district or was it just all the local? Uh, no, we always uh, have a business rep. Okay. Uh, and the international, you know, they'll, they'll send in um, support, mm -hmm. like an attorney, a uh, money crunching, you know, I mean, um, I, I can't say enough about um, the international and, and what all they did uh, helping us and the mm -hmm. people that they sent in. Um, Why was it so hard getting the company back to the bargaining table? Is it, do you think it's because it was the new company that had merged with PIMCO? It was the new new company that had came in and take, taken over and um, the man that they hired to run it um, was famous for busting unions and that's what he was planning on doing. Mm -hmm. um, what was his name? Do you remember his name? I don't remember his name right off my top of my head, but uh, he came in to do that. Um, but when the community got behind us, and most of our people that couldn't go for you know any length of time without a job, we were able to put them to work. And the ones that weren't able to um, leave to go to work, like. Me and my husband both worked out there. Me being the financial secretary, I couldn't leave and go work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, in order to get your strike benefits, you know, you've got to pull your shift, whether it's walking the picket line, answering the phones, or you know, whatever they ask you to do. Well, if you were out of town working, you couldn't pull mm -hmm. your shift. Mm -hmm. Somebody would do it for you, and then you paid them your strike money. So we all helped each other, um, and you know we were able to not get you know to where I mean nobody tried to cross the picket line. Mm -hmm. But what what they were trying to do was they were trying to um, take away some of our classifications, um, and they were trying to. Um, like uh, if you have your airframe and power plant license, your A&P license, you get extra money. Um, there was, and that was for any classification you were in, but they wanted to take that pay away from certain ones. If you were a painter, they didn't want to give it to you. And, um, but we all stuck together, uh, you know, even though it didn't affect us per se, you know, we all stuck together on it, and we were able to uh, keep everything and get more. So, it was I, it, yeah. I was going to ask, what, what was the resolution of the lockout? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it. Um, like I said, we uh, they did not cut classifications. We kept everything like that the same. Uh, we got our raises. They didn't take any of our vacation time away from us, and all of that. So. What was the mood at the at the shop like when y'all went back to work? Um, it was. It and was, did everybody? Everybody went. Back everybody to work? went back to and work. And all the people that had been brought in were all gone. Well, some of them were there, but okay. uh, this is what we we had done. Is um, <laughs> it was funny because it was actually one of our members that drove the bus that was taking them back and forth. How? How did that turn out? Well, see, to start with, see, he was, um, he had been doing that prior to. Uh, he was buying into the company. Okay. And um, so he had been doing that. A lot of our members, you know, were really upset to start with. And then, um, you know, us as officers was looking at the whole picture. And, you know, we talked to him. And... Um, he was actually feeding us information, you know, where they were staying and who they were, where they were coming from. And so everybody calmed down, you know, and um, accepted the way that it was. And we had people that would park across the road from the hotel with video cameras, and we'd video them, and so we knew what they looked like. And when we went back to work, those few that had stayed didn't stay very long. 
Was it more because of the environment? It was or, the environment. Or were there direct threats? Or I never heard anybody directly threaten them, but you know, you can make it very hard on an individual because you got you know, you give them the crappiest job, you don't talk to them, you know. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't stay. What do you? What finally brought that um, company to the table to negotiate? At that time, um, Northwest uh, had told them that they weren't bringing any more of their work in there till they got us back to work because they didn't like the way the work was being done. Had the machinists um, organized Northwest at that point? Because didn't they merge with Delta in 2009? I can't remember, Frank. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think that they were. You don't think that? Uh, I don't think that they were at that time. In 2005? Yeah, I don't think that they were. Okay. But, um, see, because the workers get really close with the reps of these different airlines because they're down on the floor mm -hmm. and they talk to us and they see the work we do um, more than they do the people sitting in the offices and um, so if you can get your reps behind you mm -hmm. like we were able to do it on in the strike and on this mm -hmm. then um, you know I mean that the reps for Northwest uh, they donated canned food, and they'd just come by and stop and check on us. And were the reps out of the management and not out of the work? They, they were management okay. for Northwest, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they just really liked our work, the quality of our work. And we got their um, airplanes out on schedule and uh, with zero uh, right ups at the end when we turned the uh, airplane over to them and they did all of their checks and test flight and everything it would come back you know that they didn't find anything wrong mm -hmm. so that certainly helped <laughs> I also see here that in 2005 1632 merged with uh, no, they didn't actually. What happened? Okay, well, in 2005 is when I, I quit there and came to Fort Rooker and joined 2003. Oh, okay, so there wasn't, mm -hmm. so the company continued for, and the local continued for a while after right, that. Right, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry for getting no, those no, facts that's okay. wrong. There's a lot to remember. Oh, there's I know. A, it's, a uh, <laughs> so why did you, why did you? Well, actually, before we wrap up, is there uh -huh. anything else you want to say about your time there or with Local Lodge 1632? Anything I didn't ask or? No, I think we pretty much covered, okay. you know, well, everything. Well, we yeah. can come back to it mm -hmm. if you think of something. So why did you decide to move to change jobs? Uh, my husband and I both worked there, so whenever we were on strike or locked out or laid off, um, you had no income and no insurance, mm. and and we had thought about it in the you know in the past. One of us going somewhere different to work, um, and uh, Fort Rooker was hiring, and um, so I put in an application and uh, got hired. So and it was union, so I just swapped over mm -hmm. and, uh, did you have another probationary period before you could join the union I uh, not it the way that it is if you are already a union member mm -hmm. um, you have 30 days to uh, turn in your your paperwork and get transferred in so I, I didn't miss a beat mm -hmm. I just um, so it's different if you're already a union member than if you know you're a new one. Now, as far as on the job, I had you know I had to go through the whole probation stuff, but um, as a union member, I just kept right on like I never had changed. How did the work? 
how did the work at Fort Rucker compare to what I did? Today? What you did before? It was a lot easier. Um, naturally, you know, helicopters aren't as uh, large as airplanes. Mm -hmm. So easier in terms of. Um, like the side, like the, the physical size, side, like right. moving you, things or yeah. We well, see you had to work off of tall stands and ladders, and uh, I have never even seen a ladder at Port Rooker. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a trick. We have some little step stool type things, but uh, you don't have a ladder. <laughs> But it is. It's a, it's, it's, I say it's easier physical wise. Okay. On you. Um, so what did what did you come in? What job did you? I came in as a sheet metal. Sheet metal. And are you still doing that? I still sheet metal. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, what is your on the day to day? What kind of things are you doing? In that uh, I, right now, I work on uh, Blackhawks, and. Um, we uh, we train the military to fly. So all of our helicopters take a beating uh, with all the hard landings, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of uh, cracks and bends and dents, and um, and we we fix all of those. So you're you're um, cutting the bad damage out and making new parts and putting it back together. And does that involve like welding? Do you know how we, to weld? We don't know. I don't know how to weld. Okay. It's uh, mostly um, shooting rivets, rivets and high locks and uh, cherry max. And you uh, were in that job. Well, actually, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So how did the work environment compare to your previous? Um, it's... Uh, because I imagine being on a military base, mm -hmm. it's, well, a, it's, it's, a, it's a different... It, it is a little different atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, because at, at PIMCO, we had different hangars, but it was all in one spot. Where um, here, you're spread out, and um, you've got um, first, second, third shift. You've got odd work week on all the different shifts, and um, you know we've got over three thousand union members. Uh, so you basically get close to the people that you work with, but then there's just so many more that you don't know. Um, so. I, I, you know, I think we were more like a family at, um, at 1632 because of being able to work so closely together where, you know, here you're so spread out that um, you never get the opportunity to meet everybody. So walk me through driving into work. Like you go through the, do you go through the gates right over here? Yes. So walk me through, like once you get to the gate. Yeah, once you get to the gate, um, you have to show them what's uh now it's a cat card and it's a military um thing you have to go through a security check um for them to issue you one and you have to show that to the guard then they scan it for you to even be able to get on on base and then um do they check your car every time you go through no it? it's random okay but i have been checked mm -hmm. um you know they you're not allowed to bring, you know, any guns or anything like that on post. Um, but yeah, they uh, they have certain times that they will be there, and they like maybe every fourth vehicle they'll just pull you over um, and you know check everything, and make sure that you've got insurance because you have to have insurance mm -hmm. on your vehicle, and you, you know your tag and your registration and all that's up to date. So. Okay. And then how far is your drive from the gate to the hangar you work in? Mm. Uh, the, in the uh, Monday through Friday, we have a gate um, that's closer. 
So it's when I get to the gate, it's maybe three miles. Um, on the weekends, that gate's not open, so then it's um, maybe seven miles. So how big is Fort Rucker? Like, is it like 10 square miles? How huge is That's it? That's bigger than that. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know, because we even have uh, Karen's airfield that's not on the base. That's B. Is that K-E-R-E-N-S? C-A-I-R-N-S. -C okay. Which we have a map here, don't we, Freddie? Yeah, we got a map of the stage fields. So. Yeah, so you can kind of look at it and see the... Uh, but yeah, it's it's quite, mm -hmm. quite large. There's even a lake on it. Lake Tulaka. Mm -hmm. And then housing on it, the military uh, uh, housing. There's uh, three housing areas on post, and then the uh, uh, headquarters and parade fields and such as that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a, what, a bowling alley, and then they got, they got like a, a water the, park. Yeah. Wow. For the dependents. They got schools. Mm -hmm. On the base. Elder On the base. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Whoa. The theater and... Uh, I want to... I want to go see it. I know I, I probably couldn't get... You just have to um, go to the... Uh, go through the gate into the visitor thing. You have to have, you know, ID, mm -hmm. and they'll give you a visitor's pass, mm -hmm. and then you can go on base. Okay. So then maybe the next time I come, I'll plan to do a tour. Okay. And just, yeah. like, could you go with me and show mm -hmm. me around? Mm -hmm. And show me, because I... I, we, I, I couldn't take you, you know, inside the hangars and stuff, but we can definitely drive around. You can see. Okay. And you can see the different helicopters and stuff. That's we have a museum also. I, well, I want to go there too. Yeah. I That's to, really, yeah. you'd really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. 2003 was instrumental in helping it. We were the largest contributor to the, uh, to the museum. museum. Okay. Yeah. And when they dedicated, they didn't even mention, didn't even mention the uh, workforce. Or the, That's how it uh, always is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I went to, I got, uh, well, y'all remember Larry Joe from the class right. in, in June. Mm -hmm. So I've been, they've got a museum in Oak Ridge about the, the uh, nuclear plants that they have, mm -hmm. the labs that they have up there. And they talk about the work, but they never mention, and, and, but you're just in passing, like, this is what we do here. Like, that's right. how, not these are the people doing it. This is the right. work they They never mention the unions. They mention ever oh, yeah. ever ever mention the unions mm -hmm. and it just made me so mad but I, maybe they're used to it I don't know I'm sorry to interrupt the interview no, on, no, the, no, on no, this tangent good. on yeah. this tangent um, but it just the more you talked about the base the more I thought I'd really, oh, yeah. I mean, I'd that's, really love yeah. to see that oh yeah because so. you know I mean it I mean and I like to show it off I mean it's mm -hmm. you know I mean I'm very proud of what mm -hmm. we do of out course here. of um, course um, well and it's 11 so let's maybe go for 15 more minutes okay. and then we'll Take a break for lunch, and then mm -hmm. we'll then we'll um, come back and finish up this up after noon. Um, so you and so you were describing that you go on the base and you mm -hmm. get your car checked, and then you'll go to drive depending on the day of the week, either the what three miles or the seven, seven miles. miles, and then and like is the parking. Uh, like, do the people working in a particular hangar get to park there? Uh, yeah, you know, usually each hangar has their own parking area. Um, some of the parking is closer than other areas. Mm -hmm. um, at um, Hanchi Field, um, we call it the hill because it's, it is up a hill. Mm -hmm. And um, the workers actually have to park at the bottom of the hill and um, there is a bus that you can check, you know, ride mm -hmm. back and forth in the mornings, in the afternoons, or at night, whichever shift you're working on. If you don't want to walk that far, okay. Um, and how do you spell? You said Han Hanchi. H A N C H E Y. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I wouldn't want to walk up that hill. In it's, summer, anyway. In winter, it's just as bad. You're freezing, and then when it's raining. Okay. I, I, I've done it. I know. I mean, that's what I'm like. <laughs> You're miserable. I hate the hill. <laughs> it's one big slab of concrete. It was prior to Da Nang in the Vietnam War. It was the world's largest heliport. Hanch Field was declared the world's largest for the number of aircraft and the size of it in one location. Okay. Um, so you don't get to see everybody? No. Did you, um, in a ch and you started working there in 2005, mm -hmm. has your work changed at all since you've been there? Have you taken on different responsibilities or different work? Um, I became, um, let's see what they call it, um, confined space qualified, uh, so that I, uh, I can go in um, fuel cells and do sheet metal work. Um, that's about the only thing that's changed. You have to have go through some little special training mm -hmm. um, and wear a respirator and stuff like that. But that's basically the only thing. And you don't use it that often. The um, who who do y'all negotiate with? Do you, is it is it so? Are you contracted to the base? Mm -hmm. And so you negotiate with a contractor, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And how have y'all had any issues with them? Uh, <laughs> yeah, since, always, you, yeah. since, since you've been here, since <laughs> you always, here. I think, always have issues with them. Um, yeah. We were um, right now. It's funny you should just bring that up because um, AFS is called Army Fleet Support, which is actually owned by L Three. Um, their contract was just bid it on. And um, AFS, Army Fleet Support, did not get awarded the contract. Uh, M1 Solutions got awarded the contract. But Dynacor and, and L3 are um, protesting the election. So uh, I think it's March the 31st. We'll find out who is going to actually be the contract company that we're going to be working for. So um, until that time, we're still working for AFS and life goes on just like it, it did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after five years, you ran again for Secretary Treasurer here. Actually, I did not run for it. It's a very sad story of how I became in this position that I'm in. Um, Philip Williams was the financial secretary. Um, I had known Philip for a number of years, um, you know, being involved in the district and, you know, uh, but uh, he had a massive heart attack and passed away. So, um, they knew that I was the only one that they knew of that had ever held the position. Um, so they asked me if I would take it mm -hmm. and you know do the job. And I said, yeah, I'll do it till his term's up and then we'll see. Um, and nobody's ever run against me since then, so I'm still here. <laughs> um. Was it different doing the finances for this local than the other one? Were there any differences? It, there was a lot of differences because you got a lot more people. Um, we did not have any full time at 1632. Um, and here uh, we did have a full time secretary. A um, lot more responsibilities, a lot more individuals, you know, that you had to do the records and, and you know, all of that stuff for. And uh, plus, uh, they were in the makings of uh, building our new local when I 
came on board. So I was involved in in all of that. Um, and uh, so yeah, we went from uh, one full time person. Now we have two. And uh, very very nice local. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you get time off for your secretary treasurer work, or do you have to do it on top of your forty hours every week? Um, most of it is is done, um, you know, on my own time. Mm -hmm. um, like um, when we have the audit, or you know, things like that, or the Grand Lodge auditors mm -hmm. here, uh, then the local pays me for eight hours. Um, you don't get paid for any overtime, you know. I, mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, but to me, you don't do these jobs for the money. You yeah. know, you you do it because it's something that you believe in. Um, I'm lucky. Uh, there's no way that I could do everything that ha that's required to be done um, after I get off work. Um, so I'm very lucky that I have. Um, Denise Brown as the full-time accounting assistant. Um, she was, uh, I, I actually talked her into coming and um, doing this part-time <laughs> and um, it went to full-time. <laughs> but she loves it and um, she does a great job. Makes my life easier. Um, is there anything else about your work? Because we still have to talk about being a Labor Council delegate and District 75 delegate and um, the Southern States Conference stuff that you're doing, but we will do that after lunch. Okay. Is there anything else to sort of wrap up this part of the interview that you want to talk about um, regarding being secretary, secretary treasurer for your um, 2003 or being a member or the work or the membership or anything related to to this part of your work life? Not really? Okay. Why did you whisper? <laughs> you made a leave? That'll be off the record. <laughs> Okay, well, um, to be continued after, after lunch. <laughs> well, we are back after a great lunch at DeLynn's. And Macklin's. Macklin's, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Macklin's. <laughs> sorry. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, continue talking about some of your other work. Uh, it's a, I know you were briefly a delegate for the Wiregrass Labor Council. Uh, yes, um, the Wiregrass Labor Council is... Uh, it consists of local unions in this area, like the postal workers. Um, some of them worked at uh, Farley Nuclear Plant. Um, Does it include the pilots? Did I see a pilots association? Uh, the, the pilots weren't in, in it at all okay. time. They're not. Yeah, they, they're eligible, but they just sat and affiliated. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But um, uh, we would meet once a month. And it was basically uh, for political purposes. Uh, we'd uh, discuss issues um, that politically would. Uh, I mean, might have lost my words. Um, pertaining to us and and what jobs we were doing, and discuss um, in like local areas even. Uh, people that we knew that were running for jobs in politics that um, asking people to help them and we'd have some of the local people that were running come and speak to us and uh, so it was a lot of lot mostly politics mm -hmm. and deciding uh, which candidates we needed to vote for. Okay. And did you do that for? I did that for several years I couldn't even tell you how many. Okay. Um, but I did that for several years. Okay. Um, and then you were also a delegate to District 65, 75. Yeah, I was okay. a district delegate. Um, and what is the role of the delegate um, it's, from the uh, local to right, the district? To, um, at the local level, 
um, they vote on the delegates and the delegates um, vote for the local at the district level. So um, same way like when we have our local meetings and um, we had to vote on paying the bills, the delegates at the district level vote on paying the bills. Um, so it's just, you know, you're representing the way your local would vote. Um, and as of uh, a delegate, um, you have to audit books twice a year, every six months. And um, uh, I, was, I still am on the audit committee for the district and have been doing that for a number of years. And on the audit committee, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the regular kind of uh, activities? Yeah, right. As the audit committee, um, every six months, we will look at the uh, the bank statements, uh, the record of the bills, and uh, you want a bill and you want the check that was written. Uh, for every everything that's paid out, you want a receipt of some kind, uh, and it's got to be either in the Constitution or in your bylaws. And even if it's in the Constitution and bylaws, it still has to be voted on by the membership. So what you end up doing is you have the six months records, but you have the meeting minutes uh, and the bank statements, and everything's got to match. Mm -hmm. uh, so like you're going to... Uh, vote to send two people to a convention. It's got to be in the minutes that you voted on it and who they're sending and then you have to pay their lost time, their hotel and stuff so you're going to have a receipt for all of that. And it's all got to match and your bank statements, you know, the end and balance is all got to match. Savings accounts and everything. Okay. Uh, it's just keeping everybody honest. <laughs> how big is District 75? How many locals are in it? Is it seven now? No, it's no we got more locals than that. Because yeah. there's like seven locals in our little local, our big local. Mm -hmm. I'm saying uh -huh. little local. We have little locals in our big local. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't even know. I should have that number, but I don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is it Alabama and, and like we have northwestern Florida? Like we have southern that? Florida, and we have some in Georgia. Okay. And Alabama. And one in Mississippi. Yeah, one in Mississippi. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty big area. It is. It is a call. large district. And do y'all have District Seventy Five meetings in different areas each no, year? No, they're all they're all at the district office in Enterprise. Okay. But now. Um, to help the locals out on um, in money, uh, we only meet quarterly, but the executive board meets monthly. Okay. But um, okay. Sandy also serves as educator for the district. Yeah, I forgot oh. about that too. Oh, yeah. don't forget about that. <laughs> so what, what what does the educator do? Um, but you know, I I uh, I get in. The newsletters and the pamphlets and things like that that the international sends out mm -hmm. and um, they send those to my house and I make sure that we have them at the district and they're passed out and anything educational wise that um, has come across uh, then you know it's my job to try to put it out there to educate the people about what's going on okay to just pass the information along right just pass it along do y'all encourage folks to go up to the, and I didn't ask you this, have you gone to the harbor for leadership training or any kind of trainings? Yes. What I, have you gone for? Okay, I have gone for, um, my very first time was for financial officers okay. class. I've done that twice. Okay. Um, I have gone to leadership one, two, and three. I've done the women's class, did the history class. Um, and uh, a communications class. Okay. So lots of, you spend lots of time at the I've, I've had several um, training. Yeah. I always learned so much. 
they the machinists have a great program for yeah, education yeah, to its membership. Definitely, it's, it's awesome. So when you went for the second business training, the financial the secretary. I'm sorry, yeah, the financial secretary training. Um, had they up? Well, yeah, they, they had updated things. When I first uh, started in 1990, everything was on paper. Okay. You, you did everything by paper, and then they went to uh, computerized, mm -hmm. and um, so you had to learn that program. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, that was a big step. Yeah, from going to being a mechanic and sheet metal worker to trying to sit <laughs> down and learn how to do a computer. <laughs> well, I'm sure you do a great job. Um, so, the other thing you are involved with is that you are secretary treasurer for the Southern States Conference. Yes. And what, which all states are in the Southern States, or what all areas are in the Southern right. States? Right. Uh -huh. um, it's. Uh, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Texas, just all of the what they Mississippi, consider Alabama, yeah, Mississippi, Tennessee. Alabama, Tennessee. Does it include Oklahoma or Arkansas? No. Or, or Virginia? Virginia, yes. Okay, Kentucky. Kentucky, yes. But that Puerto Rico? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have. Um, I mean, I know Puerto Rico is technically not a state, but right. But yeah. isn't it, it? But it's part of the Southern Territory. Um, yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, it is. Um, and we have a uh, conference once every two years, and we hold that in uh, in the South, but in a different state and town basically to uh, try to spread it, you know, around so it makes it easier, you know, for different ones. We don't want the same ones having to travel all the way across the south, you know, every time, mm -hmm. so, but yeah. Um, and what is the goal of the Southern States Conference? What is the um, purpose? It's to, uh, I think, bring all of the um, south together. Uh, we do a lot of educational training uh, at our convention. It usually lasts uh, three or four days and uh, like we uh, have had classes on pension, we've had classes on 401ks, uh, on organizing, uh, anything that at, the, at that particular time that is, is going on then uh, you know we try to have a class somebody professional comes in and, and teaches it. We've even held a financial class because so many people that's in the union, they don't really understand um, where their dues money is spent. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, they have a lot of questions that sometimes they may not feel comfortable going to the local and asking. Um, so, you know, we've had classes on that. And they give out pamphlets, you know, and stuff, so you could take that back home, and uh, hopefully spread the knowledge to your members that didn't get to attend. Mm -hmm. so. And that's only been going on since 2011, 2010, thereabouts. Right. Maybe 2000. If it's every odd year, if maybe 2000. Uh, 2009. I think it was the first one. Yeah, maybe. yeah I think so, maybe. something like that. And they had it in Marietta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. At the at Little Lockheed. Mm -hmm. And then, do you remember where it was in 2011? Uh, we had it at Myrtle Beach, South okay. Carolina. And then to uh, go against what I said earlier, the next time they had it at Myrtle Beach. They had it there two times Twice. in a row? Yes, okay. they did. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, next time we had it in um, Las Vegas, I mean, uh, it was out in New Orleans. New Orleans. It was okay. New Orleans, and then this time Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, so this year was in Nashville. Nashville. Okay. Mm -hmm. So y'all are looking for somewhere different for yeah. next year? Next year. Or the year after next, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said earlier, I enjoy mm -hmm. planning conferences, so I just... Oh, yeah. That was for me more than for anyone. Mm -hmm. But that's great, though, that it's picked up traction and that it's been consistent and they've been able to really stick mm -hmm. to it and do it every other year. Yeah, we, we try to look for a uh, place that has a hotel that uh, has union workers. Mm, that's hard. And it's hard to do. 
but we also have to have a hotel big enough um, to have our um, conference in, mm -hmm. not only because, you know, we have a lot of people that attend, but your meeting rooms and um, we usually have a, uh, if, if someone's retiring, then, you know, we might have a big um, supper thing for them. If not, we try to have a, a finger food get together um, so everybody that brought their spouses or their significant others, you know, we just kind of all get to know each other, meet and greet type thing. Nice. Um, and when did you get involved with the Southern States? Uh, what year was it? This is 17, 14, 15, yeah, it was sometime around then. Uh, yeah, 2015. Okay, and how did you get involved? Um, because I, because right. you do financial stuff here. I do financial stuff. And then you were on the audit committee mm -hmm. for, I've for done, I've District done the, 75. Yeah. <laughs> the, it, it's, a, it's a, like finances are a big deal and it's a I, lot. I have, so. Yeah, I've, I've done, you know, the finances since basically 1990. Mm -hmm. That's when I started out. And it's just something that I, I feel comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in 2014, I... Uh, I mean, 2013, I went to the uh, uh, Southern States Conference and uh, was able to meet Judy Pierce, that was the financial secretary, and uh, sh they put me on the audit committee at that time for them, and uh, then... Um, oh, so also for Southern States, you were on the audit right, committee. Right, I was okay. on the audit committee for that, and um, then uh, in uh, 2015, Judy was planning on retiring. Um, and I was encouraged um, by Bob Martinez, which was the VP for the Southern Territory, and um, se several other people that um, knew me and knew how long I had been dealing with the finances mm -hmm. and said, you know, I think you really should consider running for this position, you know, since you like doing this so well. and. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, get elected to go to the conference and um, uh, was nominated and uh, nobody ran against me, so I uh, had it for two years and got re-elected with nobody running against me <laughs> this time either. <laughs> I don't know, I'm still trying to figure out if it's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> I hate to say it, but since 1990, I've never had anybody run against me for the job. So I think it means you have a very good reputation and that you're very good at what you do. So. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to take it that way, you know. <laughs> well, how are the financial needs of the conference different from financial needs of the local? The, uh, the conference um, is, is, is a cakewalk compared to uh, doing a local because... Um, the only money that comes in and out is basically uh, one time a year people have to pay, uh, well the, the locals in the districts pay affiliation fees, so they you send out letters and they come in and you put them in the bank and you record it and you do that. And then your basically your expenses is just every two years when you have a convention. Okay. So. Um, you know, we're at a local, you've got monthly bills, and, um, you know, it's just a lot, lot different. And it's very, very, very little. Uh, you spend a little over a year not having a whole lot to do, but the, the year that you're going to be putting on that conference, you are, it's crazy. Well, are you allowed time off work to? No, it's all done. It's all done outside of work? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And how big is the, so as secretary treasurer, are you pretty much just involved with making sure things get paid or in like presenting a budget and saying we have this much money to spend on this meeting or are you more involved with the planning of the meeting or? Uh, yeah, it, 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 it is the president, vice president, uh, the secretary, which is myself, and then um, the uh, presidents of the state councils makes up the executive board okay. so I'm in on making you know or bringing forth decisions and uh, you know 
when we do meet. That's kind of it's kind of different than when you're in a local in a district um, because some of the things and it's put in our bylaws. If something comes up, we can go ahead and pay it without it being you know voted on. Mm -hmm. But then we have to get it uh, voted on and approved when we do have our meetings. So uh, yeah. I'm pretty much involved in any of the planning for the conference, and uh, but I'm I'm real stickler about what they spend and don't spend, and that's probably why you have such a good reputation. <laughs> um. So I, we're sort of getting close to the end. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody that you have known? Or you have worked with, or who has um, maybe been a mentor to you, or or provided guidance when you needed it. Is there anybody you think of as being, you know, like sort of right. playing that role right. in your in your life? I have I have several um, people. Um, I guess the first person that got me involved was uh, the president of 1632 at that time, Tommy Knight. Mm -hmm. um, great man who passed away with leukemia, but. Um, He's the one that actually got me started, um, and I've been fortunate enough that I've had uh, a good leadership, like Galen Allen. Um, then I've had wonderful Grand Lodge auditors, Jay Borman, um, uh, Stan. I can't remember Stan Brown. Okay. Um, His name's on the tip of my tongue. Rob. Uh, Minnick. That's it. M I N N I C K. Mm -hmm. Rob Minnick um, was my auditor, and then uh, he was the general ST at uh, International for a while. Okay. But uh, my favorite auditor is Scott Ferguson. I, it was uh, my first financial officer's school at the harbor. Uh, he was in it. So I, we go way back since 1990. And uh, I mean, I can call him at any time and he gets right back up with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I like so much about him is whenever I do something wrong, he gets on me like he's supposed to. I mean, because, you know, that's his job. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's never come between us, you know, because I know he's only doing it because I need it. And, right. Uh, yeah. um, and then um, when I came to 2003, I depended on Freddie Head um, for guidance and background. And uh, Was he president at the time that you came on? Trustee. Trustee? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because I, I, was, I was new, I knew a lot of the people, but I knew Freddie better mm -hmm. and uh, never once questioned if uh, I could trust him or not trust him. I knew I could trust him and believe anything that he told me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he was a big, big role model for me. Um, then, um, Brother Bob Martinez, he actually was uh, spent time with us when we were locked out at at Pimco. Um, and uh, so you've known Bob for a while. I've known Bob for a while, um, and uh, just you know an outstanding individual man. I mean, I think the world of him. And uh, so yeah, there's there's been quite a few. Ricky Wallace that was president for. Uh, the Southern States. When I came on board with it, he was the president, and uh, we uh, we just uh, clicked, got along, and you know, he made it made it uh, that much easier because um, we you are under a lot of pressure during that time to to make that conference click and go and run, you know, and uh, uh, he was he was awesome to work with. Glad he got the position he's in, but we hated to lose him at our level, so, yeah. but yeah, 
that's just a few of them. There's a lot more, but that's just kind of the top ones, I would say. And is there anything about your work history or your life or any aspect of being a union member that we didn't cover today that, that you'd want to talk about? Uh, I do know that um, we, were, we did say a little bit about the difference in the small local versus the larger local. Mm -hmm. um, and you know you, you couldn't do this at our local on the level that we are as large as we are but when I was at 1632 um, it was small uh, we had a single a lot of single parents that were raising their children daddies and mamas that were shop stewards and different things and and our meetings was on Saturday night and um, the only way they could come is if they brought the kids and we had a room that we bought coloring books and toys and stuff and the kids would play. And um, I, as a matter of fact, I, my oldest granddaughter is 17 and when she was a baby, we took her to the union meeting with us. And uh, so she's grown up understanding unions and knowing what unions are about. And I think that it's, um, I think that we need to do that more in our families. I think we need to get the younger generation at least a little educated, whether they ever get a job that's in the union. I think they need to appreciate it. Anything else? That's it. All right. Well, I really appreciate you taking time to be interviewed. I hope you've enjoyed the interview. And what I didn't mention earlier, but I think folks know, is that Freddie also sat in on this interview today. He's been a he's been yeah, he could, he's he, been an observer this well, week. Well, you know, he's helped me fill in some of the things I couldn't remember. <laughs> like I said, I'd said earlier. You know, he's one of my role yeah, models. Like yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Understandably. So uh, thank you again, and it's been a great interview, and I am very excited that we were able thank to you. get it. And whenever you retire, I'll come back, whenever that is, however far away and long that long is. A long time from now, let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back, and I'll, I'll get caught up in the last years, last of, your, years. of your prestigious career. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. <laughs>